Hey there, everybody. Pete Parno here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Friday Morning at the Fun House with Martin Popoff. What's happening, Martin? Good morning. How's the rain treating you over there? Yes, definitely. Nice, nice and rainy, nice and dark. A good time to write about the damned, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm working on that book. So I'm writing about their very gothic album, Phantasmagoria, this morning. So it's, uh, it's perfect weather for that. Perfect setting. There you go. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll send you some of my sunshine uh, later on today so that yeah, uh, yeah. once you get past that, you can, you know, experience something a little different. So uh, we've got a really fun topic here today, guys. Um, you know, we've done shows here on the channel, especially on the In the Prague Seat show, where we've talked about some of our favorite epic compositions, right, in the kind of Prague and Prague metal and fusion categories. So Martin and I were talking, we're like, well, what about those long songs that we just really don't like? So today's topic is epic length songs that suck that we don't like. So we'll just preface this. I have a feeling we're going to upset some people here today, and that's okay. <laughs> um, these just songs just don't work for us. For whatever reason, we're going to get into them. But uh, we fully understand there's going to be folks out there who probably love some of these tracks. And if you do, that's totally cool. We all don't need to love the same songs. But Martin and I will give you some reasons why we don't like these tracks. And I'd say just have fun with it because I think we did as well. But yeah. for me, it was kind of hard to find some songs because I typically like longer songs. So I really had to go deep on some of mine. So if there's any of these that folks aren't really that, that familiar, well, I think most people are going to be familiar with them. But uh, we'll see. I think Martin and I took... Um, and I really went for long ones. I know Martin picked some that were like in the eight to 12 minute range. I went pretty deep with like really long songs. So uh, I'll have Martin kick us off with his number five. We'll see how this goes, right? All right. So yeah, num number five here. I'm going to start with a really contentious one. We'll, we'll upset the boss immediately for this one. So uh, Deep Purple in Rock, uh, Child in Time. Um, you know, you do, you do know that is my favorite song of all time, right? Yeah, I know. I know. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so here's why I picked it. So, so, um, I went and played it again and I realized that, uh, what is it here? 10 minutes and, and 20 seconds. So June, June 5th, 1970. Um, you know, I loved, uh, being, being an angry young metal head. I just loved how this album was probably the best of all the 1970 albums, which is basically this one. Very heavy, very humble. Black Sabbath one and Black Sabbath two. Paranoid, all 1970. This is the best one of the 1970 albums, and and I think uh, you know every song's heavy and to the point. Um, Flight of the Rats a little long or whatever, but Child in Time. Um, so it it might have been better for the episode if it doesn't quite fit. Um, but I, it's almost like I would have wanted uh, if they were gonna put a mellow song on this album for it to not be super long like this and, and dominate how long it is. But, you know, I'm playing it again. And, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very cool lyric and a deep lyric about Vietnam war and all that, but you know, the music is lifted from it's a beautiful day, bomb Bombay calling, which is hilarious if you play the two together. Um, but going through it, not, not very much happens. So I, I, I like the long songs where a lot happens. Like they give you, it, it's, it's not really a long song. They're, they're just essentially giving you three or four songs in the long song. That really is not the case here. There's the long mellow intro. Most of it is, is that pretty simple, straightforward melody throughout. I know it's an Ian Gillen singing showcase, of course, as well. Um, but there's a long, long batch of Richie Blackmore soloing. There's only one little fast part, but it's not really all that written. It's just like, here, here's a fast bed on, on which Richie can solo. There's some keyboard stuff. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd rather hear, I'd rather hear a uh, Ian Gillen singing showcase in a normal song. I'd rather hear Richie soloing in a normal song. I'd rather hear John Lode's Lord soloing in a normal song. Um, so this, this strikes me as a song that's a, just a little bit guilty of not very much happening other than the dynamics and all that. And it being, being a great performance, but um, no, I'm just uh, never, never a huge fan. And, uh, you know, and then, and then bad memories of, you know, hearing it again on made in Japan and it's two minutes even longer at that point, you know, thank God it's not a 24 minute dazed and confused or whatever. That was another one I was almost going to pick for this was dazed and confused actually, um, which, you know, would have got heck for that one as well. But uh, so there you go. I just, it, it, unfortunately I just skip it every time, every time I want to play this album, I, I skip that track. It just takes too long to get going and not much happens. There you go. 
Well, we could spend the entirety of the rest of this of this episode on me talking about why I love that song so much. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. I, I get it. I've heard it before from other people. For me, I've been swept away by Child in Time since the first time I heard it. I mean, Ian singing, going from like that kind of gentle to the raging screams, Blackmore solo, John Lord. I mean, I love it. I, I For me, it totally works, but I get it. I mean, it is, yeah, you know, you have to wonder if you cut that song in half, would that yeah. please more people, right? And some of those raging screams are falsettos. And when I don't like when he or anybody falsettos, it sounds like a cheat and it doesn't even sound all that good. So, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not a powerful scream the way that Aerosmith draw the line is a powerful scream when they hit that part or back in the saddle, like that kind of thing, like where you think, Oh my God, his voice is over forever. Right. When, when you do that falsetto, I don't know, man, there's just something a little comical about it. So. There we go. See, when I hear Ian scream on that song and like on Born Again, see the hairs on the back of my neck, they're, they're standing up straight in the attention. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know. <laughs> all right. I get it though. I get it. Um, all right. So my uh, my first choice coming at number five. Well, it doesn't really matter. Well, like, who cares where I start here at this point? Uh, I'm going to go with uh, E.L. First of all, I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> Memoirs of an Officer and a Gentleman from Love Beach, Emerson, Lake and Palmer. So uh a horrible album cover notwithstanding a horrible title uh you know the band i think it's the end of the 70s the band are trying to again all these prog bands as the 70s are winding down seemingly like uh, fig, trying to figure out what the hell to do with themselves here so you've got these short pop songs mixed with these longer tracks the band still trying to re to capture what brought them to the game right to begin with uh memoirs of an officer and a gentleman it's uh 20 minutes long it's got moments of brilliance. This is Emerson, Lincoln Palmer we're talking about, but it's it's really light. It's missing the bombast. And I think there are probably gonna be people who would argue, but it's it works for its uh, melodicism and gentleness because you've got you know Keith uh, Emerson playing a lot of piano. Uh, there's some pretty nice uh, vocals from Greg Lake on here. I just don't think at 20 minutes it works and again, much like you with Child in Time, maybe you cut this in half, it works a little better. I think there are moments that work throughout this song, but it's almost like, let's put a epic length track to help save this album, which they probably thought was a turkey anyway. And as it turned out, that was indeed the case. And, and they put it at all, you know, almost at the end. I don't know, it just, for me, it doesn't work. I like parts of it, but don't do an epic just to do an epic when all the pieces don't really fit well together. And I think that is going to be a theme of a few of mine coming up where it's like, I love epic length songs, but you got to hold my attention throughout the whole time duration, whatever it might be, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, this is easily 10 or 12 minutes too long. It's got its moments, but it doesn't work overall as an epic length composition. End of yeah. rant on that one. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, when when you're no longer hungry or whatever, and, you, and you're no longer like super daring with what you're doing, right? Like you say, it's just it's just almost there to check off a box or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, for, for cred, right? Uh, okay, so my next one, um, let's go with um, Tales from Topographic Oceans, right? Um, you know, I, I almost felt it was our duty to include something from this. One song. of us had to, right? Yeah. You, you got four choices, right? You got four long songs, right? And and I actually went and, and back and compared them. You know, as, as a whole album, there's something really cool about this. Like, it's about just going right down the, the rabbit hole with Yes. Um, I love the music. I don't know if I'm ever going to love the lyrics. It's just too creepy and religious culty to me. It's just very, very weird lyrics. Um and uh, and but but the music, there's a lot of really cool, daring music on it. So I actually did something that I've never done before and, and like compared the sides and figure out which which one is the is the one that I don't like. So so I picked uh, I picked side three on this. Um, hang on. The, the ancients giants under the sun. Yeah, it is side three. Yeah. Um, and then I thought side one is almost as bad. Um, and my favorites would be side two and side four. I've always liked side four best ritual. But uh, so the wiki says about uh, about side three, the ancients is attributed to the piranhas, meaning a, of ancient times, which contains 18 ancient allegories. Steve's guitar wrote Anderson is a pivotal in 
Sharpening reflection on the beauties and treasures of lost civilizations. The lyrics contain several translations of the word sun uh, or an example, uh, explanation of the sun from various languages. How felt the opening section of the track amazes him to this day, thinking how the band could go so far out. He plays a steel guitar and a Spanish Ramirez acoustic guitar on the track, described as quite Stravinsky and quite folky. It's very noisy. There's a lot of noisy stuff on this. Um, but, you know, the one good thing about this as a long song, what do you got? <laughs> nice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, what are they talking about? I mean, the music alone, but what lyrics like don't even, don't even take us there. Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but so this has a lot of noisy stuff and it doesn't have any of the great, uh, it has one section later on, I think it's about the 14 minute mark where there's, where there's some good, you know, acu yeah, melodic stuff with John singing, but there's just so much wacky things going on uh, all through this thing that uh, it all, I, like I say, it almost felt like, uh, like it was a duty to pick one of these uh, for this. So there you go. Yeah. I mean, I've had a love hate relationship with that album my entire life. And I know there are people who that is the ultimate yes album because it does everything that yes does so well when they're left to their own devices. I, I find it a hard listen at times. And I, you know, to sit through topographic oceans from start to finish, that's like, that's gotta be a labor of love, uh, you know? And, and it's like, and I, you know, there are times I'll go a couple of years without listening to that album. Just, yeah. just It's impenetrable. If that is a word, right? That is a word. Yeah. It's just really, it's almost like there is a wall around all of those tracks yeah. that you have to really try hard to squeeze your way through. And the lyrics and the music, and don't get me wrong, there's moments of brilliance on that album. Absolutely. But I just, I find it's a hard listen at times. And I know, you know, people are going to hear that like, oh, Pete, that's the best yes album of all time. Well, you know, what you, there's plenty of what yes does so well on that album but and that's that's a great example yeah you can pick any track off that yeah. album right you know great album cover though great title one of the best no, no problem there it's your one standard the, yes thing but you know you're kind of in for trouble when you when you look at that right then, then yeah. it starts getting oh, yeah. a little weird and spacey and look at all those lyrics and and you know they, they shouldn't have let john do that to it i think yeah <laughs> you, you know there's trouble of brewing when rick when rick wakeman of all people is like whoa hold on a second i'm yeah. out of here this is even too much for me right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is longer than my longest gown <laughs> <laughs> not even a case of beer that's sitting behind my uh mellotron yeah, yeah. over there can help me through this one right <laughs> not even two curries on my keyboard while i'm playing live are going to help me with this <laughs> yep oh boy all right so my next choice uh talking about uh bands or singers left to their own devices uh how about the celebration of the lizard by the doors um listen i am a huge doors fan i love jim morrison i i think he was uh you know one of those geniuses from that era who unfortunately got taken away from us uh, way too soon due to all the excesses of the of the business of the life and all that sort of thing and it's weird how celebration of the lizard has almost this like mythical like aura of it, you know, because it's one of those tracks that was not included on a regular album that they played live quite a bit throughout the years. Every performance, it took on some sort of a different uh, lyrical uh, avenue and, you know, musical passages. It, it just, it changed and it morphed from performance to performance. I have tried for like 40 years to really get Celebration of the Lizard. And to this day, I just don't. And no matter which performance I listen to of it, I'm just kind of sitting there thinking, huh, this is like Jim's spot in the at the, at the concert where he's just going to go wherever the hell he wants to go. And the band is probably sitting behind him thinking, all right, we really have to be on our toes here because we got to keep up with this guy. We don't know what direction he's going to go into. Again, there's if you're really into the whole the whole mythology of Jim Morrison as a kind of visionary and a poet. I can see where, I mean, I have, a, I have a good friend who worships the Doors and thinks this is one of Morrison's greatest achievements. I've always had a hard time understanding that. It's just the song to me is all over the place and it's just really hard to follow from a catalog where they have so many memorable songs that are ingrained in our heads and will forever be. And then you got this song, which again, like, like the Yes stuff that we just talked about, there's like a wall there. It's like you can't penetrate and fully grasp it like most of the rest of their, their material. So 
I don't know. Me, this song has never worked. I've always wanted to love this song because I love everything about the doors. And when it comes time for Celebration of Lizard, I'm like, yeah, halfway through it. And it's like this version, 17 minutes and change, way too long. You couldn't say what you wanted to say in like seven or eight or 10. Because yeah. I mean, this band had an epic at the end of almost every single album, right? Like where it'd be the end or, you know, when the music's over and, you know, all those great epic tracks, which really work. This one just doesn't for me. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I totally buy into Jim as an awesome, awesome lyricist and, and writer. I mean, there's there's a certain bunch of people that kind of want to put him down. And, and I, I never understood that. I think I think he's just incredible what he, what he came yeah. up with. You know, it's a little bit like Rush. You know, if the guy sticks his neck out there and tries harder and tries to be literary and, and literally puts in some effort, I mean, those lyrics will stand the test of time better better than your than your basic song lyrics right where yeah. where you're trying not to be pretentious right yeah so it's it's like he's the he's the prog rock of lyricists right yeah and, and i think the lyrics are there's some really interesting lyrics in celebration of the lizard yeah. but i just you know maybe it would have been better if he kind of broke that up into i don't know it just it doesn't yeah. work for me and it's not pleasing to the ears and i think that's kind of what we're talking about here right yeah. if you got if i'm going to sit through 17 minutes keep me entertained, keep me hooked in. And I'm finding that is just moving in all these different direction. And Jim is just shouting this and spewing that. And I'm like, mm, that's not the kind of doors that, you know, and I don't mind the angry burst of things because we've seen throughout the doors his history, short history when he was alive, where that really worked for them, that element of danger and angst, right? He was yeah. amazing at that. This just doesn't work for me. And I wanted to, I, I desperately, I've been trying to fall in love with Celebration of the Lizard and, you know, the song of the Lizard King for so many years. I just, I just can't have a hard yeah. time with it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of when the music's over either. I, I just find the, the music track of that is just too conservative. Right. So, all right. Uh, so my next one is Judas Priest, Angel of Retribution. Where's my notes here? Um, there we go. Angel of retribution, um, Loch Ness, um, you know, this was a perfect choice as well, because the moment this album came out with Rob coming back February 23rd, 2005, it's 13 minutes and 28 seconds long. Um, soon as this came out, he, they were absolutely getting a ton of stick for it. Everybody was making fun of this song, you know, and, and right from the start, they don't even know how to spell it. So it's Loch Ness, one word with a small N. Like, you know, I, I, I had to look that up on Wiki this morning going, is it ever spelt that way? No, it's never spelt that way. It's Loch and it's Ness as in, you know, Lake Ness. Right. And they um, should know that. Right. Being yeah. Like, it's, okay. it's ridiculous. Right. So, so, you know, this is Rob back. It's the big album. There's a lot of interesting, um, kind of daring songwriting on it. There's some really good songs on it. Um, okay. Revolution was very different for them. Um, Worth Fighting For was really cool, straightforward. Uh, Demonizer, a few. Judas Rising, I thought was a little kind of, um, you know, two wrote OTT. But, you know, they basically, um, you know, uh, the, the, whole, the whole back end with this massive long song. And so I went and played it again. And, um, so it's got a minute of guitar noises to kick you off. So you're already not, not even interested. Um, it's got a slow section. Then Rob starts singing. It's still slow. It's got this dull riff. Um, it never picks up. There's a mellow part. And then the worst part of the whole thing is it's got this chorus that sounds like a Russian folk song. It sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like uh, when, um, when Accept does those those really kind of low Russian, you know, comrades marching choruses, right? Um, but even worse, it sounds very, very, very Russian. And last time I checked, Loch Ness is not in Russia, right? Um, and, and so this chorus is annoying. And you would have thought the guys would realize this is a very annoying chorus. And they do it all the time throughout this whole song. There's lots and lots of this chorus with a Loch Ness, confess your terror of the deep, Loch Ness, distress, malinger is what you keep in all this. He, they, he tries heroically to, to, to try to be really dressy and poetic about this song and make it a metaphor for something else. But it's just, nobody can get like the, the, the thought of their, their mind that this is, this is him writing about a big fish. They should have learned this from Exodus getting all that abuse for writing Piranha, right? Um, you know, you can't write a heavy metal song about a fish, right? Um, 
you know, maybe Mastodon, you know, that whole thing is kind of cool what they did, but, but no, uh, this is, this is piranha all over again. And then they just hammer it home by making it super slow, 13 minutes long on this, on this grand reunion album with Rob. Um, so yeah, there's just nothing, nothing much to it. I, I, I made a note here from, uh, uh, Jeff Barton's review. He said, uh, he gave it three out of five stars. Um, Dropping the overall score solely due to his dislike of the track Loch Ness, Barton claims that the track sends the entire record crashing down in flames. Loch Ness is so ill-conceived, so long drawn out, droning and dismal that is that it is single-handedly destroys what would otherwise have been a triumphant Halford-led return. So yeah. he, he, he says it perfectly. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> And with that song, the bridge to Nostradamus is built. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. 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 Uh, Read my quatrain. It's going to get worse. Yep. <laughs> All right. I'm now here we go. I'm going to piss off a lot of people here. And I apologize. Uh, I love this band. I, well, I love this guy um, to death. And again, this is another one of those songs that I have talked to so many people throughout my life who are also fellow Zappa fans who adore this song. And I have never liked it. I don't understand the acclaim for it. Billy the Mountain from just another band from L.A., 20, just under 25 minutes of, uh, you know, like Zappa and Flo and Eddie from the Turtles doing trying to do like a Abbott and Costello routine. Yeah. I don't get it. I just don't get it. You know what? I don't even know where to begin with this song. It's like, you know, Frank Zappa in his, in the various incarnations of all the mothers, you know, whatever, and his solo always had like something compelling musically to draw you in. And then whether it be the earlier, more psychedelic material or the later kind of, uh, you know, humor and social satire and political stuff that he got into later on, there was always, you had a mix of the two. And I find 25 minutes of Flo and Eddie and whoever else, I don't even remember who else, you know, Zappa himself and whoever else was in the band at the time, I, I forget the rest of the lineup, just everybody's just kind of talking and kind of singing and telling jokes and laughing. It's it, To me, it's just like, it's just mayhem that goes nowhere for practically a half hour. And maybe you had to be there to see it live, to fully appreciate this. Maybe it's supposed to be this kind of like Broadway slapstick type of thing, but man, when you're listening to it, move on to the next track, right? I, I'd rather hear Call Any Vegetable. That's the second track on the, on the disc, on the album. Uh, I, you know what? I don't get it. And again, I've talked to plenty of people who absolutely love this and they think it's one of his best epic compositions. And I'm like, you know what? For me, I wish Flo and Eddie never played with Frank Zappa, to be honest yeah. with you. Nothing against them. The Turtles on their own are fine. Uh, but him, together with those two guys, it's just like, I'm not into it. And that's why, like, I've done, like, ranking shows on Frank Zappa top 10 songs, and people are mystified that I never pick anything from this period. That's the reason why, because it's just, it's too much. Yada, 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 blah, 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 blah. Shut up already. You know what? Shut up and play your guitar. Perfect. Sweet Flo and Eddie out the door. They're fine on their own. I don't want them in this band. Yeah, that, uh, sorry. Billy the Mountain, Billy the Boredom. Goodbye. Yeah, I, t <laughs> I, t I totally agree. I mean, they, when when the Zappa, that is the wacky hippie Zappa from the early days, I'm not into at all. I, I, I don't think that dates well at all, but I love Zappa humor starting in around overnight sensation in the mid seventies, all forward. And when Frank himself is doing it, um, you know, along with Ike Willis, um, you know, that that's my favorite. And, and I think all that stuff dates well. I even think Broadway the hard way dates well, even though it's all like like 80s news stories and 80s politics. I don't care. I love right, it. But, but the music that goes along with yeah. all that is fantastic. Exactly. Right? Yeah. For me, the reason why this period doesn't work is he's got this great band. And instead, let's just listen to Flo and Eddie go on and on and on about shit yeah. that we don't care about. Right. Yeah. And that's why to me, I can't even listen to that stuff. And I know there's people who love those albums and I yeah. get it, but I don't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Okay. So my, uh, my next choice, um, the Stooges off the debut album, um, We Will Fall. Um, so what we have here is a, uh, a heavy rockin' pioneering, you know, 
heavy metal claims it as an origin record punk claims it as an origin record uh i want to be your dog is a big heavy metal classic punk classic whatever you want to call it 1969's heavy no fun real cool time and um not right literally uh little doll everything's pretty rocking on this album and it's it's got a pretty good recording it's produced by john kale um and everything's short uh and then you've got this 10 minute 15 second song on here which is a drone where nothing happens it's a creepy creepy talk about religious cult music this is way worse than tales from topographic it's og ram ja ram ja ram og ram and then iggy just like crooning in the background so it's this it's this creepy horror movie chant for 10 minutes and 15 seconds. There's no, no, no guitar bass drums, any of that stuff on it. It's just this. And it goes on forever. Um, I, I talked to, yeah, I've got a, a couple of quotes here from, from Ron Ashton uh, wrote up kind of the story of this. That's just one of these little 99 cent things. I've never put it in a book, but um yeah, well, we planned it right from the top. It was a chant, Ui Sui Jam Jam Ram. It was from David Alexander. He was into mysticism, reading all the books about religion and the occult and different things. He liked George Harrison. So he was kind of following that path with people looking at stuff and checking it out. And that was his contribution. We were thinking of something different to do. So we thought we'd give it a chance. We sat in a room and did that chant and then went back and played instruments over it. So it's really true. If you say anything long enough, you might think you're high. It's supposed to get you like relaxed, like the feeling of being high and euphoric so we just sat around in a sound booth on the floor with candles and incense and did a chant um and then and then at the end john kale puts a little bit of a uh, violin on it badly mixed it's like loud and it sounds kind of out of place um uh he usually clicks the headphones to tell us to stop but he had to come in and tell us we went huh what oh hey like they were all and we had fun piecing it together scott ashton says um just brought his artistic uh, abilities. He brought his name and played a very nice violin solo. We will fall. That song was a Christian chant that Dave Alexander, the bass player, had been listening to. He read a lot. And that was a period he was into chants uh, to fill the album out. Let's do a chant. Let's put a, music, a little music in there. Um, so it's a meditative, relaxing thing that they were that they were going for. Totally doesn't fit. Only song that's not heavy on it, just like Child in Time. Uh, you know, it would have been one of the one of the good ones for uh, you know songs that don't fit. But uh, but yeah, 10, 10 minutes and fifteen seconds of this, and really nothing nothing happens. It's literally to uh, to just take your take your mind away somewhere else. But side two will snap you back to reality, but fast. So <laughs> one word: buzzkill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Total buzzkill. Yeah, For sure. yeah, that completely does not fit. I remember the first time I ever listened to that album. I was like, "What? What is this doing here?" Yeah, right? Yeah. This totally does not fit. <laughs> All right, uh, my next choice, man. I could have picked. Well, I'll, I'll hold up the album, and I'm sure people will know where I'm going with this. Pink Floyd, Omagoma, right? <laughs> I love the first half, which has the, you know, the kind of the full band stuff, right? Um, very cool. Then you got all the solo pieces. Could have picked any of them, really. Uh, this was one of the first things I thought of when I, when we were talking about doing this. I decided today to pick on Richard Wright and his uh, four-part Sisyphus, which, uh, and the reason I picked his above the others, because the others don't really work for me that, that much either, but you know, you think Richard Wright and Pink Floyd, you think of these lush soundscapes, these very interesting, you know, you got, he was just a master at creating like these uh, pastiches of sound and color and using, you know, Moog synthesizers and Hammond organs and electric pianos and all this stuff, you know, Mellotron here and there, whatever. And you would think that let's give, everybody's going to get their solo spot. You would think he'd put together something really interesting, pleasant on the ears. Instead, you've got this Sisyphus with all this clink and clanking, unkeyboardy sounds that just like from each part, four parts here, none of them work for me. They're, they're noisy, they're avant-garde. And it's just like, where did this come from? Because he never did anything else like this. I mean, in any of the albums that, you know, throughout their career. And you know, I could have picked the Nick Mason stuff, which doesn't work for me either. Gilmore's is kind of weird. The water stuff is crazy. You know, whatever. 
all of these solo pieces don't work for me uh, as songs. And maybe that's my issue with this album. It's like, I, I love, you know, they, they redo some great songs on here. Astronomy, Domine, Careful With That Act, Sauce of the Secrets, Set the Controls for Heart of the Sun. Those are all great, great performances on those. And then you get all the solo stuff, which is like, you know, kind of like what ELP did on uh, those works albums, right? It's like, let's give everybody a chance to do their own thing. Uh, instead of doing solo albums, we'll, we'll do it on here. None of it works for me, but Richard Wright's, I think, is the most disappointing because I think we really wanted something really interesting from him. And it's not interesting at all. It's just noise. And I like noisy stuff. This doesn't doesn't please me at all. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable that that band was able to make so much uncommercial music before getting to Dark Side of the Moon. I mean, I think it's seven studio albums, seven or eight albums getting there, right? And it's all on a major label and it's all actually selling half decently like like they're this they're there's just percolating along work and band making this really really whacked out music for a major label and and getting press and people it's it's quite a quite a testament to the 70s that they that they could put out and that's that's the you know the biggest deep end album of all of them right yeah 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 and there, there's parts of this album that i love um mm. but i you know it just I don't know. Maybe it's the older I'm getting. The the more stuff like this uh, just doesn't doesn't work for me anymore. I don't know. You you I want to because I love adventurous, different stuff. Uh, but it's gotta it's gotta latch on somehow, right? And that just yeah. doesn't. And and he's such a talented guy that uh, I, I guess I want a little more. Yeah. All right. So my last choice. I wanted to start off with a ridiculous choice, and I'm going to end with a ridiculous choice too. Um, off of this album here, you might have heard of it. It's called Led Zeppelin 4 or Untitled or Zozo or IV or 4 or just Led Zeppelin or, uh, yeah, basically Untitled, right? Um, so uh, there's a song on here, a uh, fairly famous song called Stairway to Heaven, right? Uh, you know, they used to have these classic rock things, uh, you know, as a kid where, uh, you know, they'd count down on New Year's Eve and it would always win the greatest song of all time. So, um, you know, if if uh, if we do these shows where we, uh, you know, we may debate the meaning of overrated or underrated, um, you know, this is a song that you can't help. Uh, even even if you love it to death, and I like it a fair bit, but if you love it to death, even then you have to admit it's overrated because it's the highest rated song of all time by anybody, right? Um, but um, I've always kind of had it in for this song, and I, I swear it's not because it's been played a million times, because everything's been played a million times on here, but, you know, Black Dog, cool, heavy song with that weird meandering riff that keeps going over over a drum beat that sounds fast, but it's actually slow. Very interesting song, rock and roll, total punk rock, just seething electricity, Battle of Evermore, beautiful, beautiful, soft, uh, soft song in there, Sandy Denny, um, Misty Mountain Hop, interesting sounds, cool, interesting um, um, arrangement, moves along, Four Sticks is cool, Going to California, my favorite, acoustic zeppelin song of all time or maybe friends actually above that when the levee breaks with that with you know the, the apocryphal interesting recorded in the hallway drum thing stairway to heaven on the other hand i actually think is the least creative song on this album um musically although it's probably the best lyric on the album so you got to give it that it's got a great lyric it's got a lot of lyrics. It's a pretty long lyric. And yeah. they, you know, they, they were proud of it that they put it on the inner sleeve like that. But I find the, the acoustic part. Um, so first of all, it's eight minutes long. I find the acoustic part. Um, number one, there's all that contention about, is this a lift anyways? Uh, yeah. I, who, who was it? Uh, Oh man, it was, it was the most recent case. Anyways, it's, Spirit. it's a bit of a steal, right? Um, so you've got that, that goes for two minutes. This is kind of interesting about this song. I, I just noticed this when kind of breaking it down. It's eight minutes long and it actually has essentially can be broken up into four two minute parts. Um, so it's got the acoustic part. The next part when um, when Jimmy comes in, I'm not I, I'm not happy about that chord sequence. And I think it's kind of just boring and dull and it's a little bit dated and psyche. And he's got no effect on the guitar. It's a little bit like that lazy, um, you know, we've just got electric guitar um, with nothing on it and he's just strumming away and blah, blah, blah. 
then you get the um then that same thing keeps happening but the drums come in and it's kind of like just moving along uh and then you get the heavy part where um you know get the guitar solo is quite lauded but the, but the chords behind the heavy part is just your kind of variation on the whole louis louis dan it 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 so I don't even think that's all that creative. So, so all the acoustic parts, are, I mean, all the, all the guitar parts, all the riffs on it are pretty pedestrian throughout this whole thing. Um, and yet, you know, like I say, uh, it's, it's got that great lyric. Um, it's got the other arrangements. I got a quote here, um, John Paul Jones. I, I did that, that Zeppelin book where, uh, you know, in, in one part of it, there was, a, there was a sidebar where I included some of these quotes from these guys. But John Paul Jones told me, he goes, I remember Stairway to Heaven was done kind of around the fire, a big fireplace sitting around drinking cider. Paige had a few things worked out on the guitar. He had these different sections and he was just playing them through. And I remember picking up, I brought all my recorders on my bits and pieces and picked up the bass recorder and started playing that rundown with the guitar then robert started jotting a few lyrics down as a very organic process as most of our music was somebody would start something somebody would follow uh the lyrics uh john paul says they seem to be right in context i mean nobody's quite sure what stairway to heaven means and that's and that's one slight knock about this lyric it is a little hippy trippy that a lot of people you know it's it doesn't really mean anything super super deep and this almost sounds like it maybe doesn't because he says and it probably added to the overall mysticism the mystique that surrounded it but andy johns told me he goes uh he goes uh uh, John had done the records. Robert is sitting at the back of the control room. And I said, Robert, it's your turn to sing. Oh, really? Well, I'm not finished with the lyrics. Can you play it again? And he's scribbling away on this pad. Okay, I'm ready now. And I think it just takes two takes and one punch in and something it was done. So Robert, Robert plan is just like kind of a, at least the end of it, just kind of working on the lyrics at the end. So it probably is a little bit more uh, hippy trippy and not all that deep meaning as, as we all make out. And, and like I say, you know, for all that, for all the cool, sonic things that jimmy did even all all on the rest of this album and the cool arrangements and the great acoustic stuff i don't think any of the parts of this are all that crazy interesting uh like i say other than the lyrics so i'm i'm picking that one as the uh as as my last choice greatest song of all time right yeah i mean we we all either love it or have loved it throughout our lives right and we most of us are you know kind of had it up to here with Stairway to Heaven. I, you know, it's one of those songs that if I hear it once a year, I'm cool with that and I'll enjoy it. Yeah. More than that, it's kind of pushing it a little bit. There are parts I like. I think the guitar solo is, is very cool. It's very tastefully done. Uh, it's just interesting though, because yeah, at, at times if you really sit down and listen to it, it does sound like a bunch of different things kind of thrown together, but the way it's put yeah. together really works. And I think that's why it's such an endearing, a long lasting song for so many people. But yeah, and and none and none of those parts are at the inspired high end of what Jimmy did. None of it's his say uh, his Egypto Moroccan stuff, for example, right? None of it's his really complicated, cool acoustic stuff. Like going to California is amazing, right? Um, so yeah, it's just uh, it's just uh, all of those parts aren't aren't that. Yeah, I almost went with how many more times, and I almost went with Days and Confused as well. Um, because I, because I think all of them, those two for sure are songs that could have been shortened down. This is one that kind of couldn't because it does have the four different parts, right? Yeah. You mean you don't love the Days and Confused from the song remains the same? I figured that'd be your favorite version of all time, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what thirty-two minutes of it, or whatever the hell it is, I've lost track. <laughs> Great riff should have been a three-minute song. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, my last choice. Uh, again, this is probably going to upset some people, and it's quite all right. I love this guy. I do. Uh, Todd Rundgren, a treatise on cosmic fire from the initiation album, all 19 minutes, 37 seconds. Actually, no, it's 30 minutes, right? 30 minutes. I don't know. It's funny. You go certain places and they, they give you different time uh, lengths, whatever. But um, so this is on a very fun album uh, that has a little bit of everything. You know, you got the hit single, Real Man, catchy kind of that white soul thing that Todd did so well. Uh, you got Born to Synthesize, The Death of Rock and Roll, Good Rocker. You got Eastern Intrigue, another very cool pop rocker um title track is great fair warning and then you've got a treatise on cosmic fire which is you know like a million it's like a big epic length you know 12 different parts all instrumental 
and it doesn't go anywhere. It's just, it's tied on all these little synthesizer blips and bleeps and occasional bursts of guitar and drums and percussion. And it's just like, you know, if, if you could just picture listening to this with your eyes closed, it's just like, you, you, I can imagine like your head surrounded by a swarm of bees. And that's what it's, that's what it sounds like to me when I'm listening to this. I love Rundgren. I think he's a genius and I, you know, he's a great musician, great vocalist, great songwriter, but this to me sounds like, you know what, I had all these little leftover little bits that I was working on that didn't make it into any other songs. Let's throw them all together in an instrumental and we'll see how it goes. Let's throw everything into a hat and whoo, here we have it. So again, it's like throwing confetti in the air. You got a whole hat full of confetti whoo, and here it falls. And that's what the song sounds like to me. It's like, it's just, it's just, and it never ends. It's like 20 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever I said, it's just, uh, it's just crazy. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. I, I want to love it. And I know there are people, especially like prog rock fans who think that this is like the best epic track that he ever did. I'd, I'd rather listen to the early Utopia stuff. To me, that sounds like that is great song structures, plenty of soloing, but it all makes sense. This to me sounds like however long it is, 30 minutes of noodling, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, it's interesting how I went one where, one place it said 19 and change on the back of the CD, it says, I think it's 30 minutes exactly or something like that. Uh, way too long, way too much noodling. And I, I'll call it aimless noodling. Uh, some people may think it's a, big epic full of genius and there are cool parts in it but it's just um again not pleasant to these two things that sit on the side of my head and that's when it comes down to it that's why i skip that song most yeah. times when i listen to that album yeah and i mean with todd you you, you come for the vocals and and some of that blue-eyed soul stuff but i mean i i actually even prefer later commercial utopia to even proggy utopia like i i just love when when everything connects for the perfect pop song from him more than anything but uh but yeah that that's as far as you could go with that one <laughs> yeah i i don't know i i want to love it um it's and yeah he can do that sort of thing I and mean, you know todd had this i think hidden prog rocker inside of him that always wanted to come out and there are flashes of that throughout his solo career you know like on a wizard of true star there's definitely stuff on something anything uh, even the todd album had a little bit and i think he wanted the whole second half of this album to be all about that but this doesn't work where i think the study early utopia stuff i think really worked and again maybe it's because he had a whole band with him it's not just him kind of plunking around on various synthesizers and adding some guitar here and there and percussion I, I, yeah it's just i don't know it just to me it just sounds like an excuse to throw every little bit that i've got hanging around together and let, let's see if it works and parts of it does but you couldn't condense that to 10 minutes you know and i don't know this is too, too much for me a little too much cool right on so there you have it, everybody. Uh, a little rant on some epic songs that suck. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be folks out there who love these tracks, and that's that's quite okay. Um, you know, I think there are, for me anyway, there are parts. Well, with the exception of maybe Bill. Nah, I was going to say with the exception of Billy the Mountain, I just don't understand that. Sisyphus, I don't really dig too much. I like parts of uh, uh, Officer and a Gentleman, The Lizard King. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. These these songs suck. Let's just let's just be real here. So uh, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, in the comments below, put down some epic songs that you don't care for and why. And it'll be interesting to check some of those out. And uh, Martin, you got some new stuff in stock for everybody to be aware of? Uh, yeah, got my big UK shipment finally after waiting for that thing for a while. So this this was a big one off of that. The uh, the big year i heap the the thickest one yet of all of these visual biographies so it's just you know this kind of thing throughout so just got these in had them had them for a couple of days it's up on my website already with paypal buy now buttons so uh martinpopoff.com for that one cool go. and i'm gonna give martin a pass today for this child in time pick because he's wearing a cool sea tranquility shirt so <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I I I knew I'd get some stick for that one. We'll we'll see. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how Stairway to Heaven does as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're gonna get some stick for uh, a few of these, and and that's that's okay. That's all right. Um, like I said, you can't like everything, and uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, visit us on the web at www.theatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Uh, upcoming programming, like I mentioned uh, earlier this morning, we had to reschedule the Steve Lukather uh, interview. So hopefully that's coming up today. 
I'm hoping uh, Lynn Versace and I also had to reschedule our Steve Morse band album ranking and the ABBA top 10 song show. So those will be coming up probably next week. Uh, but stay tuned tomorrow for uh, Stephen Reed and myself. Actually, Stephen's going to be the captain on this one. He's going to rank the catalog of uh, UK hard rockers Thunder. I'm just going to kind of sit and hang out and listen and uh, add in some commentary here and there. And then uh, we start, of course, on Monday with uh, Hudson Valley Squares and everything else coming up during the week. So uh, for Martin Popoff, I am Pete Pardo. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.